Good morning. Is this about the right temperature? <laughs> I was sitting there reflecting on what Ann said. I've been set aside. I kind of like that, set aside. I'm not sure exactly what that means, except that I am going to translate it for myself and say, I just feel like the Lord has um, blessed me so much for having to prepare the study for really just getting into the word myself so as a teacher you it's said you really get so much more out of the material than anyone else but I, I sincerely hope uh, you're getting exactly what the Lord wants for you and that you'll set aside and be set aside for today as we look at the, the last lesson I'm kind of sad for it to be ending but um, thank you so much for coming it's a good group and we're going to have a a great program here in just a little bit. So I like to do a little recap and uh, the, stu the studies that we've done so far have been on, the first one was God's call on our lives. And the second one was God's sovereignty. And last week we studied God's provision. Today is God's evidence. But first, I'm going to do this recap of God's provision, which was last week. We saw that God is a God of great detail and wisdom. And as we study the Bible, rich truths become personal with the help of the Holy Spirit. Answers are waiting for me and for you. In scripture I'm not unique in my sin like the rest of mankind before me I am weak and sinful but as always thank goodness God will be there for me God has richly provided for me how long will I wait to claim what God has for me my inheritance awaits. The principles were these. Since God is a God of wisdom, why not rely on his timing? And not one of God's promises ever fails us. Those are the two principles. So with that in mind, let's bow for just a quick word of prayer and ask God's spirit to be with us. Lord, I do come before you and ask your rich, rich blessing on each woman here and just pray that you'll go forward with us as we study these last three chapters of Joshua. Thank you for your presence and we just ask your blessings on this morning. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, lesson four at the bottom of page 32, chapter 22, Joshua's Blessing. Joshua is speaking to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Verse 3, you have been careful to keep the charge of the Lord your God, and now the Lord your God has given you rest to your kindred as he promised them. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the land where your possession lies. Take good care to observe the commandment and the instruction that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you to love the Lord, our God, to walk in all his ways, to keep his commandments, and to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all your heart. And with all your soul. So I'm going to ask you to stop right there and go back and just focus on those words that go down the side. What Joshua is actually preaching to the Israelites. I've underlined down the left side, and when I read the Bible, as I said last week, I look for the application, I'm sure you do too, but I like those action words that just say, what am I supposed to do? So I've emboldened them 
and here they are. We're to turn, go, observe, love, walk, keep, hold, serve. There's some pretty strong verbs there. It's pretty clear what we're supposed to do, isn't it? Page 33, God has given rest to the Israelites as he promised. But the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh had built an altar. You can glance at your map on the front. The Jordan River was a boundary going straight down the center of that page between the other tribes and the ones of the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. It was Moses who had allocated that land to them, not Joshua. So this was done previously. These two and a half tribes were on the east side of the Jordan River. And they had built a huge altar. Not popular. Not popular with the other tribes on the west side of the Jordan. Therefore, the Israelites sent the priest Phineas, son of Eleazar, to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, along with some other pretty powerful representatives, ready to hold them accountable for building that altar. And here's why. God had specifically commanded them that there would be only one central place for offering sacrifices. So the tribes on the west side of the Jordan were protesting when they saw that this huge altar had been built by the Jordan. They thought it represented idolatry. So they gathered at Shiloh to make war with them. And I put a little X on your map about where Shiloh is. So verse 17 says, The whole congregation of the Lord went to them and said, what is this treachery that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away from following the Lord your God by building the altar today in rebellion against the Lord? So they're pretty hacked off. <laughs> have we not, <clears throat> excuse me, have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves. Even a plague came upon our congregation. So what are you doing? They are ranting a bit, aren't they? And it's because they are terrified, absolutely terrified of the abomination of what the altar might mean. And for good reason with regard to Baal Peor. They plead, people, please, can you hear them? They are pleading, if your land is unclean, cross over, please, cross over to where the Lord's land is, to where his tabernacle now stands. Abandon it, please. Hoping that they will stop this idol worship that's going on, or they think it's going on. You see, Baal Peor represented a very serious sin. The story unfolds in Numbers, chapter 22. Balak, the king of the Moabites, sends for Baal as Israel is preparing to go into the promised land. So this is a little bit of a backstory, and it explains why they're so terrified of the fact that the two and a half tribes were building an altar. Baal was worshipped by obscene rites. Mount Peor is where this worship was taking place, and it was called Baal of Peor. 
King Balak feared that Israel would do to the people what they had done to the others. And we've seen in previous studies what they did do. So they were scared of what they would do. So Balak sought Baal, a god of the Moabites, to curse Israel and thereby drive them out of the land. It was then that the Israelites had fallen into this idol worship. And where you have notes, uh, space for notes, I've written in an ast or put an asterisk to show you if you want to go and reference what was actually going on, it was pretty horrible. Um, uh, in fact, it's, it's terrible. So that really explains why when they saw this huge altar being built that they thought, uh-oh, here we're going to fall into this sin and idolatry again. So yes, they were ranting because of what had previously happened. Israel was led astray into sexual sin. The seriousness of that event is so significant that God warns us in Revelations against this sort of idolatry. And I'm going to step aside just a little bit to say uh, there is a website, and if you're interested in this website, uh, just email me and I'll send it to you. I hated to put it on there because, well, I just didn't want to get too s distracted with it. But honestly, the things that are happening in our culture today that are touching maybe some of our generation, but the generations younger than we I tell you, it's pretty scary. Some of the entertainments um, are, I started to say idols, but our icons, the people that are so popular, pop stars, they, they have a, a mission that seems to be heading us in that direction. And it just, I could not even look at it. I tell you, if I see images of things, I can't get them out of my head. So I just really didn't want to go onto the website, but because I do, uh, some work with in slavery, Tennessee, and human trafficking is like, gosh, you can just see a movement that is, talk about terrifying. So we can understand why these people thought we cannot have this in our society. And so they were really balking. Okay, so that's that's the backstory on Baal Peor that just says um, they better beware. We better be aware, and Revelation says we better be aware. So if you want to look at those references, um, please feel free to do that. Okay, but as it turns out, good end of the story, the Gadites, the Reubenites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh had no intention of offering sacrifices there. Rather, the altar was a tribute to perpetuate the name uh, and worship of the Lord. So it was set up to actually call attention to God. In their own defense, they voiced this. The two and a half tribes voiced this. We did this so that your children may never say to our children in time to come, you have no portion in the Lord. Our altar was to be a witness between us and you. So they showed their defense that they had actually built it for a very good purpose. Far be it from us that we would turn this day from following the Lord by building an altar. We wouldn't do that. No other altar than one to the Lord. So it did have a good ending. May I ask if somebody could check the temperature? It might need to be lowered just a little bit. Does it seem warm in here to y'all, or may, maybe it's just me? I'm sorry. hate to pass out right here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Geraldine. <laughs> Palms would be appropriate. Palms. Okay, verse 27 through 35. These verses indicate a satisfactory conclusion to the matter, but the altar was to be a witness between us and you and between the generations 
after us that we do perform the service of the Lord in his presence. It is the witness between us that the Lord is God. The takeaways here for us are comprehensive. Turn and go. Observe his commandments. Love the Lord. Walk in all his ways. Keep his commandments. Hold fast. That's a big one. Serve him with all your heart. Thank you. Separate from what's keeping you from the Lord. And if your land is unclean, move. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard about the man that uh, was told about 75% of automobile accidents happen within a mile of home. You heard what he did? He moved. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, back to the lesson. The principle is this. The distance I may have incurred between me and my Lord does have a resolution. Cross over to where the Lord is. Okay, we have the template, even though in this case with the Israelites, it wasn't necessary as first thought. It's still good to be reminded to cross over if we find ourselves where idolatry exists. And we know idolatry takes many forms. It's not just a, a rock statue. It's many things in our lives that we can certainly identify as idolatry. Okay, chapter 23. <laughs> okay, verse 2. Joshua summoned all Israel, their elders, their heads, their judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. 110, I'd say so. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Specifically the eight and a half tribes. To the eight and a half tribes he said the Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land as the Lord God promised you. God will push them back before, from before you, and you shall possess the land. By the way, that unmentioned ninth tribe is the tribe of Levi, and we talked about them. They didn't have specific land because they were priests, and they had land wherever they traveled. Okay, verse 6. Therefore be very steadfast to observe all, to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left, so that you may not be mixed with these nations left here among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or worship them, or bow yourselves down to them. But hold fast to the Lord your God, as you have done to this day. Know assuredly that the Lord your God will not continue to drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a scourge on your side and, a thorn, and thorns in your eyes. And now I am about to go the way of all earth, and you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one thing has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised you. All have come to pass for you. And again he says, not one of them has failed. If you transgress 
the covenant of the Lord your God, which he enjoined on you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from the good land that he has given to you. What is the covenant at this point? What, what was urged on us? What is urged on us as children of God? I believe it's obedience, and there are consequences for disobedience. It was made clear that we may not be mixed with these nations that are left here among us, or their gods, but we are to hold fast to the God who has delivered us from slavery to sin. I like the definition that I found of covenant. It's a contract, an agreement, a pledge, a promise, a bond, a deal, and a commitment. I think in terms of a marriage, commitment. It's we are bound, we are committed, not in a negative way. And that's what God uh, called his children to do. Can we see what God wants from us? Our hearts. See, the principle is in holding fast to the Lord God, it is in that that we prevail. Chapter 24, Joshua's last message. And I just love this. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your ancestors Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor lived beyond the Euphrates and served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from the river Jordan, from beyond the river Jordan. I led him through all the land of Canaan. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave Esau the hill country of Seir, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt, and afterwards I brought you out. You came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your ancestors to the Red Sea. It's been quite a trek. You have lived in the wilderness a long time. But I brought you to the land of the Amorites, and they fought you. I handed them over to you, and you took possession of their land. I destroyed them from before you. King Balak, that we talked about before, set out to fight against, and he sent Baor to curse you. But I would not listen. I rescued you. I handed them over to you. I sent the hornet ahead of you. It was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you a land on which you had not labored and towns that you had not built, and you live in them. And you eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. I brought this out, I think it was the first lesson a couple of weeks ago. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 3 says, Know then today that the Lord your God is the one who crosses over before you as a devouring fire. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprighteousness of your heart that you're going to occupy the promised land. Rather, it's God fulfilling his promise. 
Deuteronomy 11.11 11 says, it is not your doing that will enable you to cross over. It's in holding fast to the Lord who has provided the way. So if we talk about what it means to hold fast to the Lord, I wanted to do a little demonstration. Okay, can I hold this and at the same time hold this? Kind of silly, but it's all I had. <laughs> no, I have to let go of this in order to take hold of this one. It's kind of a principle. I can't hold fast to two gods either. I can't be in a covenant relationship with one and worship another. I have to let go of one and go a different direction entirely. Holding fast is simply committing my life to Jesus Christ. He says in John 10.10, 10, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. It's not a relationship that happens because of what I've done to earn it or what you've done to earn it. Hosea 6.6 6 in essence says this, and God's speaking. I don't want your sacrifices. I've already provided the sacrifice that I required. I want your heart. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. My relationship comes through what Jesus Christ did for me. I want to tell you a little story if, that kind of demonstrates this. Uh, back in the early 70s, Walt and I built a home in Indiana where we lived and we stayed in that home for about 10 years. And I found this home in the country. It was built in 1832. You heard correctly, not 1932, 1832. Old. <laughs> A project. Run down. Let me tell you how run down. I had a friend who found out we were selling our lovely home and moving to Pierstead. <laughs> My sister-in-law is laughing. And I'm going to quote her. She said, Annette, I drove by that house and um, it had a for sale sign out front and I was curious. So I drove in the driveway and got out and looked in the window. I didn't have to clear it off or anything because it was broken. Um, it looked totally abandoned. There were hay bales in the dining room with chickens or something flying around. And I said to myself, who in their right mind would ever buy this place? We did it. End of quote. The first morning that I woke up in Pierstead, I was lying on my back looking up at the ceiling at the mushrooms growing out. I'm not kidding. The mushrooms growing out of the corner. And I asked myself, what have I done? Well, the first winter was brutal. We were in northern Indiana. I forgot to say that. Northern Indiana in the middle of a wooded <clears throat> country called Nowhere. The winds blew <laughs> through that house, and we had those metal radiator things that kind of go spit, spit, but they don't give out any heat. Or if it's any heat, it was very little. Actually, Walt chopped all the firewood for the wood-burning stove that I had thought was so cute. And I was the project person. 
I did everything from stripping, I don't know how many layers of paint off of the woodwork with a blowtorch to hanging drywall. I'm serious, I did it. There seemed to be no redeeming value for having made such a disastrous decision. Spring came about uh, middle May, not like here. We had barren trees and some kind of grayish backdrop for our enjoyment. <laughs> and then they started to poke through the thawing ground. Daffodils. A few? No. A couple hundred? No. Thousands. Across our three-acre land. Here they came, up and down the road, down in the meadow, across the front yard, the backyard, everywhere. I have never seen such a sight in my life. And do you know, we had no idea those existed. No one had told us that the previous owner, who had since died, was a Purdue University horticulture guru who had planted some 60,000 all varieties that ever existed. Narcissus, daffodils, they had faces, amazing faces, amazing shapes. I had no idea, as I said, I had not planted them. They were an unearned undeserved blessing in the middle of bleakness. It was an experience that humbled me before the truth of God's reminder. It was not by my sword or by my bow that he gave me a land on which I had not labored and towns that I had not built. And yet I lived in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive yards that you did not plant. Our God has given us that for which we had nothing to do with. He gave us Christ, unearned, undeserved. Looking at Joshua's challenge to the Israelites, page 36. Now, therefore... Revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away other gods that your ancestors served and serve the Lord. And now if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Well, Israel does choose the Lord. Verse 16, the people answered, Far be it from us that we would forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us out and our ancestors from the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is he who did great signs in our sight. He protected us along all the way that we went. He drove out before us all the peoples. Therefore, we will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen. And the people said, Yes, we are witnesses. And Joshua said, Then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord God of Israel. I'd like to just stop right here and again pray, and this time a prayer for us to be reclaimed by the Lord, whether it's the first time ever or a time to just renew our commitment to hold fast to him. So if you would, and I've printed this in if you want to, 
look at it later, I think it would be great. But just to recommit ourselves to the Lord, would you bow with me? Lord, your mighty power is demonstrated in all your works because you love us so much, so much so that you gave us the way to the cross over and now we have a relationship with you. We want a relationship with you. I am a sinner having camped on the wrong side, far from you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the saving, bleeding sacrifice who reunites me to you. I want to cross over now and accept his love and forgiveness for my sins with all my heart. In Christ's name, amen. And the principle is God's mighty power and faithfulness are demonstrated in all his works. God's faithfulness is so complete that at the end of our stories, which we said sort of parallel Joshua's to a degree, this is what can be said from its beginning to its end. No one will be able to stand against me. We can know in our hearts and souls that no one of all, not one of all the promises the Lord made concerning me will have failed. Not one. All have come to pass. And I think that's the story of Joshua. We do a flashback on all the grief and the bickering and the complaints and all that they had to deal with. And we look at the end and God has not failed them once, not one time. I think it's a beautiful testimony to us. I talked to people, just talked to a lady the other day, and the trials that people have, that we have, that we don't, I mean, I've I've voiced the comment that I don't know how people go on journeys without the Lord, but it's true. If if the Israelites had stuck out, struck out without the Lord guiding them along the way, and even holding up before them the promise that, that he would never fail them, I don't know how they would have ever made it. So I think that's our overall overarching take take away from this study, that God never, never fails us. I do have a summary for uh, lesson four. It's God's evidence. Have we seen it throughout this study? In chapter 22, therefore turn and go to where your possession lies. Not one thing has failed. And in the last chapter, the Lord our God brought us out of slavery. And I have an exercise here for us. I'd like for you to just take a minute and think of the best thing that ever happened to you. And just quietly, just kind of think of the best thing that ever happened to you. And now think of the worst, if not one of the worst, things that happened to you. And then consider the outcomes of both. You don't have to raise your hand or anything unless you want to. But honestly, if, if you do that exercise and think of the outcome being, okay, if this hadn't happened, how would this have ever come about? And it's amazing sometimes how they overlap. That the worst thing that ever happened to you, it won't turn out to be the best thing, but it's like God just turns it into something amazing that we call a miracle. We have such a faithful God. Okay, just winding up. Am I trusting the Lord really trusting him to be faithful to me and that was how we started our lessons a month ago am I really trusting him to be faithful to me I hope you'll take 
the little example I gave you last week on how to study the Bible. As I've said, I know we're not amateurs in reading the Bible, but sometimes just a little tool to sit quietly and go through those steps. And if you need a handout from last week, there are a few over there. Um, but it is a point, as I said last week, where I began to trust the Lord. And it was not just a decision that I made that, oh, I'm going to be better at trusting the Lord. It was straight from the Scripture. And God spoke to me by the power of His Holy Spirit. And that's where the Word came alive to me, and that was my salvation. And I trust that it is yours as well. And the last question, am I fully convinced of God's faithfulness? And I think through studying the scripture, there is so much evidence to fully convince us of God's faithfulness. Well, we're a few minutes early. Those were short chapters, but I think they were so powerful. Thank you so much for letting me um, bring this study of Joshua to you. It's been my extreme pleasure, as I've said over and over again. And I hope we have grown with all our hearts closer to the Lord. Thank you so much. And I turn the program back over to Anne.